proficiency. Why? And here, I like to say because, you know, I had a number of conversations with different people, even, even here, and some were saying, okay, you know, FAA regulations are preventing us or, you know, this and that about FAA regulations. No FAA mandated regulation is going to make us proficient as much as they are needed. It's not going to happen. And here I like to give an example. So let's say you have this busy street, you have two stop signs on both sides. One day, you are used to crossing that street, you stop, you look around, and you go. One day, somebody stole one of those stop signs. It's not there. So legally, you can just go. Would you do it? Probably not. Why not? So why do we become dependent on government to be proficient, and there's no need for it. Those are minimums that are set, yes, as speed limits and other signage out there, but we can do it ourselves. And in fact, 80% of learning is gained after we graduate from any training school. And here I have a very personal example. I came to US in uh, 1983, I was in my 20s in high school and in college i had english classes i knew exactly how to build those sentences what are the names of individual words in it i came to us i couldn't communicate it took me four years to be able to do so so somebody could say okay yeah you got your certificate in English because you graduated from those schools why you're not able to speak because we really learn from real life that is how it's happening Cambridge dictionary says that the fact of having the skill and experience of doing something that is how proficiency is defined so let's talk about, we have Olympics, Winter Olympics uh, now. That's obviously not, not the winter, but still example. So proficient athlete. Can you teach somebody how to jump over that bar? Can you take them to a classroom and say, OK, that is how you do it? And then expect them to do it. Of course you could, but they are not going to do it. They are going to go and try it. Now, after that, they are able to do it, and they will say, okay, now I know how to do it. I'm going to stop doing it altogether. And I will come back for Olympics, and I will get a gold medal. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It has to be done over and over again. Proficient sharpshooter, same thing. You have to keep practicing over and over again. It's not a skill that you can learn. It's something that you have developed. And here, actually, I'm going to digress a little bit because you know that relates a lot of what I'm saying here is going to relate to a simulator, to simulators. And I've seen different flight instructors practicing different things in the sim or we should be saying training device, because most of us don't have access to real simulators. But for example, we practice simulated engine out. And instructor will click something on their tablet, then engine will sputter, will stop, and then we'll go and we say, okay, so now then we're going to go there and we're going in between those trees we either land or crash, something happens there. What's the purpose of this? We haven't accomplished anything here. It will be like a sharpshooter practicing with blanks. You know, you keep shooting, but you don't really know what the results are. The purpose of the sim is to develop the whole sequence and knowing it. So when things do happen, you know how to react. As 
young student pilot <laughs> flying on one of my solos, coming very slow to landing on one of the runways in Great Barrington, airplane actually stole on me. Mm. Mm. I, I'll, until today, I remember how my hands were working automatically. It all happened just like this, and I recovered and I did go around. Why was I able to do it? Because it was practiced over and over again. So instead of practicing a situation like this in an airplane, why don't we do it in a sim? But we still have to do the full sequence, so engine out, we go through the whole sequence depending on the altitude, of course, whether it's checklist or whether it's flow, then up to the end, saying out loud, loud door ajar, and everything is set for landing. Because only then we can learn. Proficient skier. Why do I bring skiing? Because I love skiing myself. And another example here to general aviation because I've seen so many times GA being presented as a mode of transportation. Do we go skiing to travel from the top of the hill to the top? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's a pleasure of doing this route. So the same thing for aviation. But at the same time, I took break from skiing for 20 years. It wasn't easy to get back. <laughs> I did. But it wasn't easy. But I knew how to ski. I could have said, okay, fine. You know, I'm going there in a black diamond or two black diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Try to kill myself. So, unfortunately, for years, I've been lying to my students. Because I was saying that Oh, you got your private certificate, it's a license to learn. No, it's not. It's a license to practice. Because learning is usually associated with gaining new knowledge. What you are doing here is you're practicing knowledge you already gained. That's the main difference. So that is what proficiency is all about. As a flight instructor at one of the flight schools in New England, I was a chief flight instructor there. And we were allowed once a month to take any airplane we wanted as flight instructors and go and practice. Every month, religiously, I would take this one here that you see here on the, on the picture and practice. Because I strongly believe that when I am going to show to my students steep turn, slow flight, my altitude allowance is plus or minus zero. But it's not something that you can just do it. I had to go there and practice it over and over again myself. So years later, all this philosophy, my philosophy on aviation education in general, I put together, I, last April, I published uh, my book called Becoming a CFI, which actually received literary award. And here I'm going to shamelessly <laughs> advertise this book, <laughs> CFIRadic.com, if you want to know more about it or get a copy. So this is why we need to be proficient. So how to be proficient 365? Of course, you can participate in things like a Pilot Proficient Center Adventure, you know, once a year. Is it going to make you proficient if you do it once a year? <laughs> Probably not. You know, it's a good way to start and see what's available. You can fly in a sim. You can participate in uh, presentations there. But really, when I look at proficiency in general, I'm thinking, OK, what are the three elements that are most important? So the first one would be ongoing. That is the 365 part. So we have to be doing it over and over again on a regular basis. Then it has to be easy to access. 
what's the easiest way to access aviation device to practice? It's a simulator. You just hop in, you don't really do any pre-flight, you don't burn any fuel, practice, go out. You don't have to pay a lot of money. Those prices, as we know, are much lower. And how many of you are Redbird owners here? There we go. And that concept also brings in your customers. If you develop this culture of proficiency, people are going to come in and do it on a regular basis. When, the, when now I, obviously I don't go to gym on a regular basis, I'm not going to advertise <laughs> myself here, but uh, I used to, but the same concept. So, you know, you start lifting something and you lift a certain weight and you say, okay, I can do it now. You don't go home and say, okay, I'm fine. You keep doing it on a regular basis and that is what you want to do. But at the same time, it has to be measurable. So how do you measure proficiency? Because you can only change something if it is measurable. If you cannot measure, you cannot improve it, period. So why and how to quantify proficiency? I saw, at some point I realized that we really measure everything in life these days. You know, I have a digital watch. Most of you probably have it too. I have my step counter. At the end of the day, I have 9,782 steps. So I walk around the table <laughs> and get to my 10,000. And it started, you know, I started thinking, why am I doing it to myself? What's the purpose? And it's very simple. It's motivation. Yeah. Cool. To get to that number. And everybody needs it. We need to motivate ourselves. Because if you have no accomplishment, and that's something that I talk about in my book, then you go nowhere. Let's imagine that you have a flight school. You get your, you know, you go for your uh, basic license and you practice, you practice, you practice, you practice, you practice. You're ready for solo, but you're not soloing for some reason. They won't let you go. You're not accomplishing anything. You're not going to be happy because you want to be able to accomplish your solo. Then your solo cross country, then something else. So that is what motivates everybody. So there are various different systems that are available to motivate yourself. I'm sure some of you have seen a Redbird Pro presentation, and that is one of them that can do that. Uh, there is another one that I developed for, for uh, EAA, and it's called Skill Score. And for example, this one gives you just one number. So, it's based on various elements. I don't know if you can see it, probably not. But this one tells you, you know, how mu much time you spent in the air, then quality of your flight, number of flights with CFI, and number of flights altogether. So that is pretty much takeoffs and landings. So you'd say you, you fly, you have 86, and then for whatever reason, you stop flying. Your number drops you start motivating yourself. Okay, whoops, it's 76, so what's the problem? Quality of flight is pretty much the same, 84 versus 86. So where is the problem? You got fewer flights, and you spend less time in the air. And you still have only the same number of flights with CFI. So then you start motivating yourself, and you go, okay, I better go flying, I'm going to grab one of the CFIs, and guess what? Now I have five flights with the CFI, six takeoffs and landings, eight hours in the air. Even though quality of flight slightly decreased, my score went up because you exercise. So this is supposed to motivate you to go out there and practice. Yes, sir. Is that in your book as well? Is that in your book? Uh, the skill score itself? No. No. Okay. No. It's just the concept. So, 
all this and skills I know the uh, uh, the uh, the Redbird Pro is not connected to Cloud Ahoy yet uh, skill score is but Cloud Ahoy is another way to get yourself uh, to get that measurement because how many of you are familiar with, with Cloud Ahoy? Okay. So if you are not, Cloud Ahoy, what it does, uh, whether you are flying in a simulator or in the airplane, it collects the data, it goes to their system, it's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It will analyze it and it's all algorithm based and they will know whether you are flying something <coughs> complex, like an ILS approach, it will pick up automatically and will rate you on it, or something as simple as straight and level flight. If you're going to practice steep turns, we'll say, okay, that looks like a steep turn practice, and they will pick it up. And then they will give you different scores. So here you can take a look at your Cloud Ahoy screen, and you can see your areas where you are good, your deficiencies in red, or things that potentially are not so bad but could use improvement. So that is how you quantify your proficiency. So how to set and use your tracker. If you're going to use Cloud Ahoy as an example, you're going to go to cloudahoy.com. You are going to set an account, log in, and you're all set. They give you, I forgot what is it, they do have a presentation here, I think it's like 60 days uh, trial period. If you want to connect your skill score to it, there are some instructions on the web to do it. But the important thing to remember is that when you go there for the first time, what is your score going to be? Zero. Zero. Because depending on the system, Cloud Ahoy is going to rate you right away. Uh, once you start flying, those scores will show up. Uh, Redbird Pro is going to start grading you right away, and not only on your flying, flying in a sim, but also on your knowledge. Because Cloud Ahoy and Skill Score, those are purely flight relation related uh, gadgets. <coughs> So for example, this one is going to look back 90 days. And we'll say, okay, within the last 90 days, what your activity was. So my idea behind it again was to have a step counter, pretty much. Something that allows me to look at it and say, I better do something. And the beauty of the whole thing is that you can do it in a simulator. And in fact, you should be doing it in a simulator. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So, for example, when you have a Redbird Pro, you create your account, you log in, your name shows up right here, and then you can analyze different areas of your proficiency. So, you know, to recap again, skill score is designed to give you that one, it's a red light on your dashboard. You know, red or green. Gear is down locked or it's not. Uh, Redbird Pro is a more, more comprehensive platform that gives you a lot more to dig in, including knowledge. Cloud Ahoy is where you want to dig 
deep in certain elements of light. And I'm going to show you Claude Ahoy a little bit more because I really love that, that element. So for example, back to skill score, my thinking behind it was, let's make it like, like a credit score, you know? So what is your flying credit score? So the first element is quality of light, and that one is fed directly from Cloud Ahoy. So you need to have your Cloud Ahoy account to use it. Then number of takeoffs and landings. So that will be how active you are going to be. We want you to practice that part. Number of flights with the flight instructor. Because why wait two years to go and fly on an expert when you could be doing on, on a regular basis. And of course, time spent in the air because we want people to be flying. And for those of you who own flight simulators, this all translates directly into your customers. So everybody wins. That's the whole idea behind it, that business is thriving and people are proficient. So what is Cloud Ahoy? Let's, let's talk a little bit more detail here. <coughs> and Cloud Ahoy is data-driven debrief. And of course, it's creating safer, more proficient pilots, all experience levels. All those gadgets are good for any pilot. There are no limitations, whether somebody is a uh, you know, large jet driver or something small. It's used by, in fact, and the people who developed this, this thing, by the way, uh, Chuck Shavit, good friend of mine, when I was starting IMC Club in 2010, he came over to me and said, Radek, I have this idea, I'm in an instrument training, is there anything we can do together here? And we're thinking, thinking, and I said, really, you know, I don't really know how to help you here. You know, it's a great idea, just run with it. And 12 years later, they have, you know, this amazing gadget here. So uh, it's used by US Air Force, Flight schools, 141, 61, professional pilots, private pilots, and just recently they developed, uh, actually that was done for, for US Air Force, they added on elements of uh, aerobatic movement. So, because before, if you would do something unusual, then the system wouldn't know what is happening. That's stabilized. Yeah. So what are the data sources? for Cloud Ahoy. And they do have another presentation here, I forgot you know, in detail whether it's today or tomorrow, but really the main data source is your cell phone. You just turn on the app, put it somewhere in the dashboard, and you go flying. That's all you need to do. You land, it will take all the data in, will process, you open the app or you go on the web and you can read it. But you can also download from uh, any uh, electronic flight bags, from GPS devices, from Garmin. There are various ways. You know, that's not the purpose of this presentation, so I'm not going to go into detail there. They use published data and uh, official weather data and profiles of airplanes that are published out there, but you can change it slightly. So for example, if there is certain model of Cessna, they will know it and they will know the performance and that is how they will calculate this whole uh, analysis. And the most beautiful part of it is this artificial intelligence that will segment and score each flight. And that is where you want to take a look when you want to quantify your proficiency. So for example, 
automatic maneuver detection, and scoring. It will break your flight, take off, climb, whatever else you are doing there, approach, landing, how stable you are, and literally, believe it or not, if you land three feet off the center line, it will tell you. And that is how it's going to score your uh, activity. So this is, for example, screened from one of the flights. Uh, uh, I obviously cannibalized some of the slides from a good friend of mine who was doing this uh, presentation for Cloud Ahoy. So she was, you know, doing this flight, and you can replay it using Google Earth three-dimensional and literally fly it on the ground and analyze what's in it. So you debrief all flights under three minutes and you always find something to learn there. So you can watch for trends. So when you go flying and you analyze afterwards, how are you going to improve things? By seeing what is happening. So where you are getting worse, where you are getting better. And again, I want to stress that Cloud Ahoy data is being fed from all Redbird sims. So when we are talking about flying, it doesn't have to be an airplane. You can hop in a sim, and analyze this afterwards and say, okay, that is where I need to improve. But again, it has to be done on a regular basis because if you say, okay, I'm going to happen this in one month and I'm going to notice that one element of my flight is not what I really want. And then I'm going to do it again six months later and it looks better. I haven't flown at all. Most likely, it's a coincidence. It's not a reliable data. For this to be a reliable improvement, it has to be done systematically. So if that is how you explain to your clients out there, it literally can save their life, and it does. So that was how to set and use your tracker. So let's connect it all together now. What is the one tangible benefit? Of course, as we said, we stay alive. That's the most important one. But there are other things. Because if you go, let's say, to any of the FAA safety team, I'm one of the reps, by the way, uh, safety team uh, presentations, what you get? You get your Wings credit, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody here familiar with Wings? All right. So guess what? Now you can go and fly in, this one has to be done in Redbird still, fly any of the scenarios developed by Community Aviation in one of the Redbird sims, and guess what you are going to get? You are going to get flight credit. Not just ground credit, those scenarios are approved for flight credit. So what happens when you do your ground credit, your flight credits, you complete a phase of wings. Entirely? I'm sorry? Entirely? Yeah. The yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then that information from the sim is fed to either, you know, skill score, Redbird Pro. You take a look at it, you see what I can improve there. Then if you want to dig deeper. You go to your Cloud Ahoy account and you really take it apart 
And there are three different levels in the cloud Ahoy. I mean, you can say, I just need basic, and it will be fine. It still will feed all the information where necessary. But if you really want to analyze yourself, <coughs> that is where it's going to be. And guess what? FAA says that if you complete stage of wings, that is going to reset your flight review clock. So if you keep doing it, you really never have to go for a flight review. But the key is here, he actually is still in the skill score. Because if you fly on a regular basis with a flight instructor, then it will be awkward, actually, to sitting down with the same flight instructor and say, OK, so let's do my flight review. We've been doing it all year long. So would I say, would I encourage people to do it entirely in a simulator? Of course not. Because the purpose is not to go fully virtual, like you know, a lot of things around are happening that way. It's still to be able to go and fly to real airplane. But when we do so, we are already proficient. Just recently, I read a post uh, on LinkedIn, I believe, one of our VMC Club program coordinators wrote that he flew somewhere, I'm not going to you know, describe all the details, but bottom line, his engine failed. He landed safely and he said, you know what? We have discussed during our last VMC Club meeting exactly that situation. And that is what literally saved my life. So when we do it in a simulator, when we talk about this, when we learn about it, stay involved, stay proficient, then yes, legally we can do this part. But at the same time, going back to my first slide, it's not about government regulations. We can go above and beyond without somebody else telling us that we either have to do it or we don't have to do it. So proficiency year round, that is what we call it in the middle of it, and a simulator here. In some cases, of course, Redbird, but any sim is good to do it. So here, let me take a look at time-wise. Uh, 15, so we have six minutes left if there are any questions. I think I calculated correctly. Yes? The flight credits in a Redbird sim for wings have to be validated by a CFI? Or Correct, yes, okay. yeah. That's all, that's the whole idea, that you fly in a sim with the flight instructor and then the flight instructor will validate that credit. All right. Is there, there a particular amount of sessions to be considered proficient? I'm sorry? How do, how do you, what does it take to become proficient? So you're and proficient everybody is different. What, so, what, what's up? so once you go through that whole process, are you, you said proficient for a flight review, or what does that take? I, I'm not sure. So you, when you do that whole wing circle, does that make you automatically? Like it's a basically, you know, if you complete phase of wings, right. you go through the circle. Then you're good for a flight review, okay? But it does not necessarily mean that you're proficient at the time. It's an individual thing. So, you know, for example, give you another, my personal example. Anybody here speaks Russian? Gavarita <laughs> Poruski. Anybody speaks French? Bar level français? Louis? German? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? English. <laughs> <laughs> See? Very well. Very well. So what I'm getting at, I was fluent in <coughs> Russian because I had to take it, you know, my elementary school that was under Soviet influence, my four years of high school, 
and college. I couldn't speak Russian besides, you know, of what I said, if you speak Russian, in Russian, that's, that's pretty much it. I will understand, but I cannot say it. Okay, so I'm not proficient, even though I was fluent. Yeah. Same thing with other languages. If you don't use them, you're going to lose them. So, you know, on the other hand, I was well thought about English structure, I couldn't communicate. So it's all individual. So you will need to, besides the facts, you know, the, the uh, step counter, if you will, you will need to decide if you need to go a few more steps to be proficient. It's, it's all, you know, that's why I plugged in, in all the system that, that systems, with the exception of Cloudahoy, that you see, flight instructor factor is plugged in there. Because that's critical. There is no way around it. You cannot heal yourself. You have to go to a doctor. And you go for regular checkups. Then you have pain right here in, in your you know, side. You go to a doctor. Doctor is going to tell you, look at you, you know what, what, what you need to do. But then you do it. Doctor may say, okay, you need to walk more, you need to exercise more, you need to eat healthier, and you choose whether to do it or not. But this is almost like, you know, it's also kind of proficiency, if you will. With all this tracking and algorithms and all that, everyone's going to become a Formula One driver, right? That's what Formula One guys do. Yeah. Simulator tracking, you know, to get better and better. So yeah. Cool. So yeah, all the all the uh, gadgets that you saw there, this is a dashboard. <coughs> you know, you don't uh, do something when you when your oil pressure is zero yeah. and temperature is pegged all the way. You do it when you see trends. Uh, Two minutes left. I'm going to tell you one more thing. Uh, I was doing a flight in Aero with uh, one of my students. It's supposed to be transitioned to complex. New engine put in the airplane. And we. I was flying out of uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. So we took off. We we're flying out. And literally, within like five minutes, I'm noticing. First, I ask my student question, so look at the gauges. Do you see anything? And he says, temperature in green, pressure in green. But what I am seeing is the trend it's going. So temperature is increasing, and pressure is decreasing, even though it is still in green. So it's not enough to say, OK, I'm good because everything is in green. You have to see the trend. So all those gadgets are designed to be the dashboard, to give you a warning sign. OK, you better do something. But from that point on, you will need to decide. Are you turning back to the airport? Are you going to do something else? Go for engine failure and off-field landing because you want to practice them? It's, it's your choice. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. We are out.